Okay, so today we're going to talk about related rates. And I have thoughts on this section. It's kind of infamous and usually considered pretty difficult. But the reason I think it's usually considered difficult is that I think most textbooks select very bad problems to show with students. So we'll try to make this less painful than it sometimes seems to be. And the idea behind related rates is clear enough to state, at least a little informally, remember that rates of change are derivative. So you can think of this title of this section as being related derivatives. And the sort of topic is if you know some rates of change can you find related rates of change. And these are all word problems. So for some students that strike one against this section, I know that not everybody loves word problems. And at least as they're traditionally presented, they require a bit of setting up. Let's sort of give a prototypical related rates problem that we can look at and solve, but then also discuss a little. So, We'll look at good old Alice and Bob of 10,000 math word problems. And we'll say that they're starting at at this building, at the coil, and they leave at the same time. Let's say 9 a.m. I guess that detail doesn't really matter. And Alice will walk south at three miles per hour. Notice the something per something else. This is a derivative, which... Um, <clears throat> We knew already speed is a derivative. Um, velocity is the derivative of the position function, I should say. And that's the Bob 
fog X at some other rate. Let's say two miles per hour. And again, the velocity is the derivative of a position function. So we're being given derivatives here, even though that word does not appear on the board. So after one hour, how quickly? So we're asking for another velocity. We're asking for another rate. So we are given two rates, and we're asking for information about a third rate. How quickly are Alice and Bob moving apart? So this is kind of a prototypical textbook Literally, it's in the textbook, related rates problem. And what we're supposed to do with this problem is something like this. We need to relate the rates we have to the rate we want. How could we relate these rates? Well, we could ask, what's happening here pictorially? And what's happening is that we've got coil and then someone walking due south from it and then someone else walking due east from it. Who's who? Alice is walking due south and Bob is walking due east. And we're looking at the distance between Alice and Bob. And once we've got this right triangle, we sort of realize, okay, um, if we call this distance B of T, and this distance a of t, and we're interested in this distance, which I'll call c of t, just because I've just used a and b. What's the relationship between a, b, and c? Pythagorean theorem. Thank you very much. A of t squared plus b of t squared equals c of t squared. And now we want rate. We know A prime, we know B prime, we want C prime. How can we, how can we bring rates into this problem? Well, this now ties back to what we talked about yesterday. 
um, we can perform implicit differentiation here. A of t, b of t, and c of t are both functions where maybe not entirely sure what these functions are. But we did this yesterday when we had implicit differentiation. We had a function y. We maybe weren't precisely sure what y is, but you can still use the derivative, take the derivative, making sure to use the chain rule. So the derivative on the left is two times a of t times whatever the derivative of a of t is. Again, this is the chain rule. We've got a function being squared. We're taking the derivative of a function squared. The chain rule says to take the derivative of the outside function with the inside function inside of it, and then multiply by the derivative of the inside function. And if we again use the chain rule, the derivative of b of t squared, we take the derivative of the outside function with the inside function inside of it. That's the 2 b of t. Then we multiply by the derivative of the inside function. We multiply by b prime of t equals one last time two times c of t times c prime of t. And we could simplify this a little. We've got all of these twos, every term in this equality is being multiplied by two. So if we divided both left and right by two, We've got a times a prime plus b times b prime equals c times c prime. And we are given information about two of the primes on the board. a prime and b prime are the velocity that Alice and Bob are moving at. I've tried to emphasize already that those rates are derivatives. So a prime is three, b prime is two, c prime is unknown. What about A, B, and C? Do we have to give up? We are not given any information about A, B, and C explicitly, but it's probably pretty evident that I didn't do this problem only to give up at the last step. We have not 
that used the information that one hour has passed. And if one hour has passed, and Alice is walking at three miles per hour, then Alice has traveled three miles. And if Bob is walking at two miles per hour, then Bob has traveled two miles. This C, we can figure out. If we know A and we know B, we can figure out C. So A is 3, B is 2, C, we don't know. So this is just some ugly decimal, but using the Pythagorean theorem, C is the square root of 13. I know I'm moving a little fast. That's because I want you to see an example of a related rates problem, but I don't really want to dwell on examples that look like this. Putting aside questions of like, whether you could replicate this work. Does this work at least make sense to everybody so far? Then we're basically done. Um, three times three is nine. Two times two is four. Let me, I was a little tardy doing this, but let me get that calculator software warming up. Oh, it's just going to sit there on the screen. Okay, I guess we wait for the software to, uh, to finish loading. Um, the square root of 13 times C prime. So 13 equals C prime times the square root of 13. And one last algebraic division step, 13 divided by the square root of 13. 3.61. Let's just round to two decimal places. It's hard for me to overstate how artificial these textbooks related rates problems tend to be. Like, I say that Alice is walking south at 
three miles per hour, and Bob is walking east at two miles per hour. And I mean, if Alice tries to walk south at two miles per hour, she's going to go right into those mountains that you perhaps see through the window and probably never be heard from again. I mean, if you actually leave coil, your paths are more likely to be something like this. Uh, this might leave from the north entrance. She might follow the path, and then she might end up on a street. And Bob might leave from the west entrance, follow a different path, do something like that. And now the distance between Alice and Bob is this, but you don't have these nice triangles anymore. You just have the paths the people would travel, so you don't have the Pythagorean theorem or any very good way of relating Alice's and Bob's position, and the entire problem kind of falls apart. And basically all the related rates problems in the textbook are like this. So you have sand falling in a perfect cone, such that the base of the cone is always exactly one half the height of the cone. And it's very convenient that the sand is falling in that particular way, because you wouldn't be able to do problems with it otherwise. Um, a more realistic related rates problem, the kind you actually see in the wild, are ones where you're given one equation And in that equation, you have a variable, and that variable depends on a second variable. So this is a very chain rule situation. You might have, you might be looking at the area of a circle, and maybe the circle is changing with time. So the radius of the circle depends on a second variable, in this case, t. And you want to know how the derivatives relate to one another. You want to know how dA dt relates to dr. DT. Given certain information, that's a related rates problem. I mean, you've got a rate and a second rate, and you want to know how those rates are related. It, it's a very um, it's a very literal set 
section title. Examples like this are a lot easier to find in sort of real world laboratories or real world scientific processes, and they tend to be significantly easier to work with than these Alice and Bob and how is a shadow changing after five hours type problems that the textbooks love. So let's give an example of a more grounded related rates problem. I mean, it's still going to be slightly artificial, but Nowhere near as artificial has Addis wandering into the mountains. Let's say that we're heating a circular thing. This example may sound very familiar. I said that related rates was very chain rule-y. We looked at heating circular plates when we introduced the chain rule. So the area of this plate is related to the radius. And if I then gave a formula for the radius and asked how the area is changing with time, let me be explicit about this if I haven't already. As a metal plate heats, it undergoes thermal expansion, so the area and the radius are both increasing with time here. If I gave a formula for the radius, as I say, this would just be the chain rule, no related rate at all, but it probably struck you how convenient it is in this class that we always have these formulas. It might have occurred to you that in a lot of real world situations where things are changing, we don't have a nice form of it, telling us how quickly the thing is changing. We can just look at it and say, yes, that's definitely changing. And we can measure how quickly it's changing, but we don't have any kind of form of it. So let's give a more realistic situation than telling you what R of T is. Let's say instead that we are measuring the radius of the plate. And that we can certainly do. And we observe that currently the radius is five inches, but at the moment that we're taking this measurement, it's increasing by 0 0.21 inches per hour. So no form to the for the radius, but we are measuring it and we can measure how quickly it's changing. And 
that's a very realistic situation. Um, physicists, and not just physicists, lots of people measure how quickly things are growing all of the time. There are instruments that will easily do this for us. And let's ask, okay, so how quickly is the area increasing? At this moment. And as I say, this is a much more much more grounded example of what a real related rate sort of looks like. We're given a rate. We're looking for information about a second. And we're going to go over here, and we're going to use implicit differentiation. It was not for nothing that this section is after the implicit differentiation section. We can take the derivative of both sides. And on the left, well, the derivative of a with respect to t is the derivative of a with respect to t. That's exactly what we're trying to find. We're asked what dA dt is. On the right, we have to be careful. We're differentiating with respect to time, and I have not used, and it's pretty unusual to use, function notation. We have to recognize that as time is passing, the radius is changing. And therefore, even though we're not using function notation, the radius is a function of time. Let me give myself more room to work with. And the reason we have to recognize this is that if we don't recognize it, we won't use the chain rule. And we need to use the chain rule. We're taking the derivative with respect to t. The radius is a function of t, so we have a function squared. When we take the derivative, the 2 will come down. This pi is a constant. It will stay put. We'll stick the inside function in. And then the chain rule says that we multiply by the derivative of the inside function. And it will usually be pretty obvious if you make a mistake. If you forget to use the chain rule, you won't have that r prime. 
And when you go look at the data you're given, you'll see that we're given this information that it's increasing by 0.21 inches per hour. And there's no place to use that information. There's no R prime in that equation. So often you can see very quickly if you've forgotten to use the chain rule, but it's still something to be cautious about. And now plug and play, or just plug into our calculator. There's almost no playing to be done. We're told how the radius is changing. We're told what the current radius is. If we plug those both into that equation, into that expression, I guess I should say, we'll get the answer to the question we've been asked. We will get da dt. And let me just do that real quick, not, not sharing the calculator. I'm going to just type, sorry, I have to mess around with these Zoom things every time the calculator comes up. I'll type two times pi, times five, the radius is five, times zero point twenty one. So two times pi times r times r prime. And 6.597. 6 uh, what are my units here? Everything, the radius is measured in inches, so the area is measured in square inches. Time is being measured in hours. So square inches per hour. And the quiz, the quiz questions are like this. There is no, you drop a tennis ball from 10 feet up and look at it, shadow questions on the quiz. They're all just, here's a formula, something's changing, find out how something else is changing by taking some derivatives. We have nine minutes left. We can at least look at another example. I mean, I certainly can we look at another example. I feel like this example is probably longer than nine minutes. Um, It's eight minutes um, sitting here and thinking whether we have time just ensures we don't have time. Let's put the example on the board and see what happens. 
happens. Maybe we'll have to finish it tomorrow. So, I know there aren't any business majors in the room, or at least I think they aren't, but a lot of applications of calculus end up being sort of business applications. Let's look at the demand for a product versus the price of a product. And let's say we sort of have an equation between demand and price. Let's say that the demand of the product and we'll measure demand in thousands is estimated to be this square root, where this P is the price in dollars. And where would this equation come from? It would come from data fitting. The, uh, the business, uh, our theoretical business owner doesn't have like some big book of equations that he's opening and picking that out of. What he does have is data how the demand has changed when the price has changed in the past. And he uses some kind of data fitting algorithm. You might be familiar with linear regression, something like that, to estimate this equation. So we have an approximate relationship between demand and price. And certainly, our business owner knows the current price of his product. Let's say, $35, and he knows the current demand for his product. Let's say $50. So he charges pretty large business, I guess. He charges $35 and sells about 57000 So maybe the business owner is contemplating a price change. Or I guess what I should say is, Maybe this business owner is having to raise his price. Like, maybe he's creating stuff out of wood. And uh, we're definitely not going to finish. My instincts were correct. Let's just end it here. We'll pick right back up with this example tomorrow.